Hey Rob, um, so sort of piggybacking, picky, picky, picky backing. That's the word, isn't it? That's the correct. What did you say yeah. piggybacking? Piggybacking, right. yeah. Piggybacking off of last week's podcast, uh, where we had a really good chat about discuss propensity. Um, in the social media that we've got for emetophobia free, uh, the, we've had so much good feedback in relation to that podcast, just because I think it was such a unique take on discuss propensity and a lot of people are really empathizing with how they can see that within their own lives and within their own fa family dynamics and i think it'd be really good to have a proper chat about how much our self-talk right because in order for us to show self-disgust towards ourselves it kind of has to go through our self-talk our inner voice um, so i would love to dive in today to okay. the topic of in a voice if you're up for that yeah perfect perfect and actually I, cool, I, I fantastic. Have... so can you tell me a bit about you know in a voice the effect that that can have on us you know the positives and the negative side of things um, because okay. obviously you know you can either be very self-critical towards yourself and unkind but you could also be positive and encouraging and it would be good to have a look at you know both parts of that yeah good okay so the the, the whole notion of inner voice. I think we talk about it in the manuals as that kind of little devil on your shoulder. You know, you say, um, you think, oh, I'll have a great time tonight at the party. And it goes, oh, no, you won't. Everyone's going to think X, Y, Z, or you're going to embarrass yourself or whatever. Yeah. But actually, it's just a, 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 that internal dialogue that everybody has all day, 24 7 in their own mind, in their own brain, right, in their own life. Every, everyone has that internal dialogue, that conversation. And obviously, your, your inner voice is the same as your external voice, your, your language, yeah, your thinking styles, all of those things and your beliefs are all part of your inner voice. So your inner voice is probably the most important, um, the most important voice in what well, it is, the most important voice in your life. Because if that inner voice is kind and loving and charitable, and honest and rewarding and fulfilling and helps you process experiences in, in an adaptive, positive, empowering way, life is going to be great. Great. Uh, uh, and in, in, if you think about it, actually, the whole program is about your inner voice. Your inner voice is the mm, way you yeah. talk to you, the way you think about you. Some people don't experience it kind of as a, as a, as a voice. Some people say, oh, I'm not aware of my inner voice. I'm only aware of my thinking. Well, that is your inner voice. It's a, yeah, it's a metaphor. We talk about it as the devil on a shoulder. But if a, a client once said to me, their best way of understanding it, they thought of Gollum and Schmeagol in The Lord of the Rings, right? Now, yeah, it's not yeah, that yeah, bad yeah, for yeah. most people, right? But it is that bad for a lot of emetophobes. You know, Schmeagol, the nice person, is tortured, literally tortured by Gollum. That real negative, mm. hostile, angry, demonic side of him that just wants to kind of capture the ring. I don't want to paint too bad a picture on it, okay? But quite often, particularly with people suffering from metaphobia, that inner voice can be incredibly critical. Yeah? And in effect, as I said a minute ago, your inner voice really is everything. That, that is the way that you are talking to yourself. Um, that is the critical functioning, if you like, of your attitude towards yourself. So if, you, if you've got some self-contempt, which is what we talked about in last week's podcast, that's where you'll see it. If you've done something today, you've done a piece of work or you've been for a run or you know, you've even cooked a breakfast, that inner voice, how you hear that then, are you thinking to yourself, yeah, that was great, well done. Or are you thinking, that was rubbish, what an idiot. Are you thinking, mm. could have done that better? Should have run that faster? You're late again, you silly sod. What's the matter with you? Or just, you know, oh, I'm failing. I'm no good at it. I'm not going to get there on time. What an idiot. Whatever that voice is, if it's critical like that, there's going to be issues. And sometimes 
the inner voice i know we often say that perfectionism is always the last thing that the emetophobes get well that fits perfectly with this because perfectionism catastrophizing black and white thinking are all part of that desire for control around the sense of just not being good enough expecting failure that self-contempt mm. you know don't forget that if, if perfectionism perfectionism isn't someone setting high standards it isn't someone uh, wanting to be successful it isn't someone wanting to be number one wanting to win the race perfectionism is someone wanting to do all those things and then beating themselves up if they don't get within a few percentage of it okay that yep. perfection yep. perfectionism is is that <clears throat> you idiot you failed you didn't work hard enough you didn't get there and so if you have that critical inner voice like that you never feel like you've achieved anything you never feel like you've been rewarded i think in one of the manuals mm -hmm. i talked about the young lady who'd won the boat race several times and had conquered was it everest or the eiger or something and then uh, also got into you know, top of the class in the military academy but even though she's been incredibly yep. successful in all of these things, she's always expecting to fail and then would always really beat herself up if she only got 98% on a test, if she was going for 100. Now, that's the critical bit. Mm. Because if you're then, oh, you idiot, Joe, you should have worked harder. Not only do you not get any sense of achievement, and bear in mind that self-efficacy, your belief in your your power your belief in your skill set only comes from you achieving things pushing yourself getting out there challenging yourself right mm. if you don't feel like you are achieving things because you're never giving yourself mm. that positive feedback then you feel empty and also bear in yeah. mind that perfectionism in in thrive parlance is really someone running away on some level from feeling a bit shit OK, I'm trying to achieve this amazing thing in order to feel better, in order to get my head above the water, to get away from these horrible feelings of averageness or mediocrity or shame or whatever else is going on. I've got to achieve this thing to get away from those feelings. So if the person isn't doing that, you know, that critical voice can leave them really quite empty and powerless. Bear in mind again the critical nature of that voice. We talked on the podcast last week when Gottman was talking about contempt. He talked about it as the most damaging of all attitudes right? that you can have towards another person or to yourself. Because if you think about it, it's so cutting. Okay, and you know all of these things are created in our childhood, right? So imagine you're a 10-year-old boy and you've played him a football and you played quite well. I mean, you lost the match, your team up, but you played quite well. Instead of your parents saying, you know, great, Joe, well done, you played quite well. You didn't win, but you played well, mate, well done. You know, you were treated with, you lost, you failed, you were rubbish, you're an idiot. Mm. It's so catastrophic. You've just had, you haven't been given any praise at all in that. And worse than getting no praise... You've had your character just assassinated with that one sentence. You failed, yep. no good. Because you didn't fail at all. It's, it's nonsense because you didn't fail at all. You, you just didn't win. Mm. Not, you, you can't associate not coming first in a race with failure. You can't associate only getting 95% on exam with failure. But that inner voice, of course... Is, is, is a projection of how you feel towards you. And we've talked before that a person's inner voice is usually, but not always, usually one or both of their parents' voice or attitude towards them. Now, this doesn't mean that that person didn't have nice, lovely, kind, caring, charitable, switched-on parents. It can be just a perception of the parenting okay from the child at the time but if you think that we copy our parents accents and we copy their language and the, and the intonation in their voice and the words that they use it's quite logical that we'd copy their attitude within those words as well right so even if your parent never says to you 
Joe, you failed, you're no good, you're an idiot. You can pick that up. Just because they were very successful, you can pick that up. Oh, don't worry that you didn't get into the posh school, Joe. I'm sure you'll do all right in the other school. Don't worry that you didn't score a goal today, Joe. You know, that kind of thing. I talked to two emetophobes last week, one an ex-emetophobe, one an emetophobe. And they both relayed stories of, in relation to their emetophobia, feeling really panicky once as a child. And instead of being uh, uh, receiving compassion and care and support, they were both told off and sent to the rooms. Now, not casting aspersions onto their parents, right? But, it, you know, if that had happened lots of times and the parents don't know how to cope, I'm sure the easiest thing to do is go to your room for 10 minutes, right? But can you imagine, just for a minute as an adult now, particularly you as a young man who might might be thinking about having a family in a few years' time, right? Imagine that your young son comes to you and he's crying and he's upset because he's fallen over and he's got a graze on his knee. And instead of giving him kindness and compassion and love and just rubbing it and saying, there you go, you'll be all right, off you go, you say, go to your room. It's so catastrophic. You're saying that your emotions are unimportant. It's saying that you're being bad by having feelings. It's saying that you're, you're just mm. attention-seeking. It's such, it's such a black-and-white catastrophic reaction. And both of them had this. In fact, one of the people that said to me that at one time, she said to me that she's got the loveliest, kindest, most gentlest, loving parents on the planet no one's had parents as nice and kind as mine but when we drilled down into it a little bit she realized that even though they were loving and kind and all of those things externally and in their words and their and their deeds they weren't like that in in their hidden stuff like in their actions towards her at one time, I think she said she broke her toe or she broke her ankle crossing the road and was screaming and yelling in pain and she got told off for being embarrassing. You're drawing attention. So the, the parent's social anxiety was more important than their child's want for love and, and, and uh, security and uh, to kind of to be looked after. Now, I'm sure that doesn't happen very often, mm. okay, but I'm just trying to evidence the kind of the catastrophic nature. The receiving end of that information. Your ten-year-old boy got a graze, a cut on his knee. Comes to his dad, crying, "Daddy, I've got this thing on his knee." And without showing any um, love or tenderness or care at all, because you're busy or you're on the phone to your for whatever reason, you just say, "Go to your room." You think about the, the, the catastrophic reaction to that if it happened more than once, if that was the sort of thing that happened a lot. I had a friend in Cambridge who asked me to see his son for a few sessions to thrive. He was at a post school in Cambridge. And he said he's putting put himself under so much pressure during his O-levels and blah, blah, blah. And I said to my friend, well, you know, where does this pressure come from? Doesn't doesn't come from a 16-year-old boy. Where does it come from? And he said, it's not me... Me and my wife have always said to them, look, you do what you want in life. You know, you, you work as hard as you want. You go to whatever school you want. Now, they may have said that. They may have said those words. But knowing them really well, that's not the message you'd have got from them. The message you'd get from these parents, if you met them for five minutes, would be, unless you get to the poshest university and go on and do at least a master's, you're a failure. That's the message you'd have picked up generally from them. We're incredibly successful. Everything we touch is, is successful. Everything we do is successful. Whether it's playing football, building a business, or, or, or just painting the garden gate, we do everything brilliantly. So the unconscious, the unspoken word is, if you don't, something wrong with you. So it doesn't have mm. to be that... Um, Rob, have you... Have you ever watched, um, just, just to touch on that, just because whilst you're talking about it, it's, it's got me thinking. Um, have you ever watched the biopic uh, of Elton John, the uh, Rocket Man film? Yes. 
perfect example within there. I know that um, just from looking into it afterwards, Elton John did work with the producers of that film. So I think it is fairly bob on, but exactly what you're describing was Elton's life, right? He had the, the archetype of his dad was this distant military man yeah. who was very belittling and cruel and minimizing towards young Elton, who was trying to be creative and expressive and enjoy playing the piano. And his mum was just as distant herself. And the whole, his whole narrative of why he became dependent on drugs and was as large and exuberant as he wanted to be is because he never felt good enough. Because, yeah. you know, he always had the, the voice of these, these parents within his head that were really, really minimizing everything that he was doing. So yeah. he never felt worthwhile. He always needed to be doing bigger things, wearing brighter colors and, you know, his, his, it's, yeah. it's that. His so. understanding of their treatment. Because it's don't forget it's always about yes. it's always about their understanding because there may well have been very very good reasons why he was treated that way. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. So it's not yeah. it's yeah. not yeah. And we're not getting at parents here. It's about the person on the receiving ends, the message that they take on, right or wrong, from that kind of thing. And we know that makes sense. We know that almost all emetophobes are uh, um, bright, driven you know, middle class people that, that that are very successful in every other area of their life have got have got, you know, that they're perfectionists, they're always striving to do better. But the other important thing is the and, and the Elton John film's a good example, maybe a better one than Gollum to be honest. But I remember seeing Lord of the Rings and then Gollum saying this one thing sorry, Smeagol saying this one thing and Gollum's voice is and it's so you know catastrophic against each other so grating i remember um what was i gonna remember i remember no i don't remember i forgot Not a lot, it's, gone, it's gone completely yeah it'll come back in a minute just reading my notes <laughs> oh blitz. you got sorry, me thinking about, about um sorry joe uh, blips is what i was going to say sure. so if you think about a blip yeah that every emetophobe has. Hmm. They have blips before they start the program, they have blips during the program, and most will have blips after the program because all a blip is is temporarily, for whatever reason, they've gone into this spiral, they've gone into this pit, they lose perspective, and then they they slowly come out of it again on the other side, right? And and learning to thrive and overcoming emetophobia is partly about managing those blips, right? But why are blips almost unique to emetophobes, right, to emetophobes. You think about non-emetophobic clients you've had, most non-emetophobes will never have a blip, okay? Mm. So few that we've never even put it in the manual, okay? So so you could argue that, you know, uh, blips are fairly unique to emetophobes or, and that type of thinking. And why is that? It's because they're catastrophic. What happens is, a person's moving forward, they're getting better, they, they're a few sessions into the program, for example, and they're seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, they're being a little bit optimistic, they have a bad day or a bad hour for whatever reason, okay, or they have a little, an anxious moment, or they say something, or someone says something, and they have a little bit of an anxious moment, and instead of reacting as the ideal inner parent, right, and say, don't worry, just having a bad hour, I'm still doing fine. Everything will be okay. They go, oh, I knew it was too good to be true. I knew I was going to fail at this. I knew it, I was going to be the one. You know, the number of emails I got and still get after I did that video with Lisa eight, nine years ago, you know, when we described her as the, the worst client ever. The number of emails I got from people saying, I'm going to be your worst client ever. Always assuming failure, but not just failure, catastrophic failure. OK, mm. that contempt, they want to beat themselves up. They want to smash that inner child into the ground for being such a failure, for being so useless, for being so bad. So that's that kind of self-disgust, isn't it? It's only disgust and contempt that would make one react with such a powerful reaction right anyone else going through any kind of training program 
okay you're learning to drive right you're a non-emetophobe you're learning to drive you've had a couple of lessons and you're doing quite well and then on the next lesson you make a mistake in backing up and you hit the curb okay anyone else might go crack it hit the curb you can imagine what an emetophobe might do it's it's the the want to pounce are oh, you idiot why did you you don't need to do that but that that voice that golem that inner voice that elton john inner voice just wanting to be so critical waiting waiting in the wings the whole time just just know i know you're going to make a mistake sooner or later joe and the moment you make that mistake i'm going to pounce on you and call you all the worst things in the world that's the contempt and the kind of self-disgust thing and that real black and white catastrophic overreaction that goes from i'm doing all right i'm getting there to oh my god i failed i'm an idiot i'm the worst person in the whole wide world that's a classic mm. example of that catastrophic contemptuous inner voice yeah yeah it, it did, but the main thing that i hear just on that is when i am talking about this with clients is well i, I can't notice it i can't get on top of it it just happens on autopilot and i don't see it so if we're talking about this it would obviously be beneficial to have a discussion around how these metaphobic clients, or, sorry, metaphobic sufferers can begin to notice these common narratives. Because I think coming into going through the program or just generally trying to improve their quality of life, a lot of people don't really realize that actually they're the most critical person within their life by an absolute mile. Yeah. I think a lot of people can say, oh, yeah, no, it was, it was my mom, it was my dad growing up. It, it is that childhood bully that I experienced for you know 10 years of my life that's easily the most critical person yeah and not really realizing that by an absolute mile it's it's yourself you're always your biggest critic right. so I'm, how can I'm rubbing I'm rubbing my elbow as I'm talking to you now I didn't even know I was doing it okay and that's the point it's habit mm. you, don't, you don't notice things mm. that you habitually do right because you do them every day without even yeah. thinking so they don't stand out but here's what you do to answer your question and it's easy. Any time that you are aware of a mood or attitude change, ask yourself, what was I thinking around the time it changed? What was my inner voice? What was I thinking? What was my inner voice around the time it changed? I was doing great until just now. And I was having a great day and I was really positive and happy. And now I'm feeling all, oh, uh, what did I do? Just get used to asking yourself, what did I do? What was I thinking? What have I done to change my mood, to change my attitude? So part of the blip recovery plan, <coughs> excuse me, part of the blip recovery plan, which I'm just about to finish, promise, is noticing that, is asking yourself, what did I do? How did I get into this situation? Let me just go back. Let me rewind this video five minutes. What did I do to take myself from having a lovely day so far and having a nice day and enjoying day to suddenly now feeling really self-critical and angry or upset? Mm. What did I do to get there? What was my journey to get there? And that's really, really important. And if you ask yourself that only a few times, you'll soon, you'll soon start to pick up on that inner voice. You'll soon start to be aware of it. Even if you can't, you know see what the, the worst the worst thing you could possibly do, and one of my least favorite phrases ever is "It was just one of those days." It was just one of those days, Rob. Rob, it was just one of those Mondays. It just happened. It was just one of those days. Yeah, 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 yeah. it just happened. And that's yeah. obviously a person not taking thing. responsibility for their thinking, not understanding yet mm. that actually these things don't happen to you, and that any time your mood or your attitude like that changes. It's because of the way you're thinking about something. It's your response to some situation that's changed it, yeah? But that's okay. People people say those things when they don't yet understand that it's something that they've done or their interpretation of something or the way they're processing mm, yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah. that's changed that. But you're absolutely right. You know, it's... it's you know, we've, we've all, always said that... Or I've always said that... 
if I were to see someone that's been through the program before or is going through the program and they're doing really well and we're not quite sure what's going wrong for them, why they're not there yet, the giveaway is always their language. Mm. Okay. The moment someone says to us, you know, you know, I was I was doing fine, Joe, and then it just happened. Someone that's thriving would never say that. Right? And I'm mm. not saying that now to be picky. As in, you're not thriving, you didn't say that. I'm saying that someone wouldn't say that. Okay? And the same way as I wouldn't say to you, I have never said to anyone, nor will I, I'm a tennis professional. Those words are never going to come out from mm. my lips, right? Because I'm not. Why would I say that? So mm. our language, because it tends to be spontaneous, because our language is spontaneous, is the gateway to our thoughts and feelings, really. It's the gateway. People say it's the gateway to our soul, right? But it's the gateway to our thoughts and feelings, right? And if I'm trying to gauge, here's this chap, Joe, how thriving is he? How much of the program is he embedded? How much of the program is he doing? And in just a few minutes, he says several things like, it just happened. Out of the blue, I don't know why, but you know that they haven't really understood yet and embedded the fact it's mm -hmm. it's not happening to them and they still um process these experiences as if they've happened to them so they so you can't feel powerful can you until you realize that you can change things until you realize it's not happening yeah. to you there's not much you can do about it so that power comes from your ownership of your thoughts and your feelings your emotions and your experiences Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, so the yeah sense, absolutely. The sense of it just happened to me. You know, I was minding in my own business and and I don't know why I was having a great day and then just suddenly. Okay. If you know, if, if you're one of those people and you're listening to this, okay, you want to think about that language, think about uh, the way you're saying it, and just start to slowly change that. Um, you know, you could change it initially by saying, well, right now, I don't know why I'm suddenly feeling sad, but I know it's me that's doing it right now. I don't know why I'm feeling panicky, Joe, but I know it's not the weather or just luck or just cause it's a Monday. I know I'm doing it, but I don't quite know how mm -hmm. yet. That's still a much more powerful position than I don't know why. Something. Yeah. And if, if you do catch yourself giving yourself a hard time and beating yourself up, you know, the, the easiest and sort of the first step that you can jump towards, if you just want to reduce, you know, tearing the arse out of how much you're beating yourself up is how would you talk to a loved one? Right. How, if, if your kids or your best mate or your mum or whoever is really important within your life was in your shoes, had a metaphobia it was really challenging their life and they were doing absolutely everything they could to overcome it. How would you talk to them? Would you be busy telling yourself why you're such an idiot and why you're never going to get over this? And how could you possibly have only put in that much effort today? No, of course you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. You'd be saying, Oh, it's okay. These things happen, right? You're, you're busy working really hard. It's down to you to, to put some effort in, but you can do that. How can we look at this a bit differently, right? How can you pull yourself back on the wagon? You've got this. It's okay. Keep going at it. You're going to be kind and encouraging, right? You're not going to be beating them up and telling them that they're a failure and that they're never going to go over this. So don't do it to yourself. Try your absolute best to think, okay, I know that I'm being a bit unkind to myself right now. I'm in the habit of doing that. That's okay. It's just a habit. How would I talk to my son if he was in this position? How would I talk to my best mate if they were in this position? And then just try and ease yourself into that slightly kinder, more patient, more charitable self-talk rather than the perfectionist contempt narrative that was busy beating yourself up. And, and the, the justification for that, right? Because any emetophobe watching this will be thinking now, but sometimes I'm in it, Joe. I deserve to be punished. I deserve, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stupid. Mm, I should yeah, be over this by now. Yep. Okay. The way the way to respond to that is that the these little blips and these setbacks 
that are responded to with that inner kind of contempt are going to drag you much further away from the successful line you were taking by your over overreaction to it than if you just thought, well, made an error there, but get back in the saddle, move on. Okay. If the ultimate goal is to overcome a metaphobia and get yourself thriving, then beating yourself up is taking a minor blip and turning it into a three-day catastrophic stress ball. Okay, That's the reason mm. not to do it. Even if you can't find it within your heart at the time to be nice to yourself, out of conditioning, out of habit, out of the fact that you're used to this, even if you believe it, even if I believe right now, Joe, if deep down I believe, actually, do you know what, Joe? You are a lazy little shit from not doing enough homework to pass that exam. Even if I really feel that, if I know that that's going to make you take another three weeks to do the exam, I'm going to bite my lip and not say it. Okay, If punishing you and putting someone down is going to help motivate you to work harder and reach the goal more quickly then it'd be worth doing but it never does it never mm. ever does okay there's no relationship yeah. between feeling guilty and stupid and working harder because it just disables you completely because the moment you start beating yourself up your self-esteem goes down your self-efficacy goes down your social anxiety goes up yeah your sense of power and control goes down your desire for control goes up you just chucked a hand grenade in there. It mm, served yeah, absolutely yeah. no purpose whatsoever. And it's not real. And it's not your voice. It's somebody else's yeah, voice yeah. that you've taken on board. And it's not healthy at all. Yeah. And if you, if you are choosing to go down that line, how motivated and optimistic you're going to feel about dusting your knees off and picking yourself back up again there's a um there's a quote just whilst you were talking because i didn't want to absolutely butcher it um that michael jordan put out the um famous nba basketball player I'm hoping that most people have heard of him but he says i've failed over and over again in my life and that is why I succeed. In fact, he kind of elaborates on a bit more. He says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. You know, and if you're sitting there struggling to make sense of that, or it doesn't really compute, it's because well, more than likely you're a bit of a perfectionist they're in the habit of beating yourself up and not seeing the other side of it. But he has had so many opportunities to grow and reflect off of where he has slipped up because he is in a, a human positive, being, he's not a computer. In a positive and helpful yeah. way. Exactly. If he misses right. a shot... So without that... Yeah, if he yeah. misses a shot, he doesn't beat himself up. He doesn't go into, yeah. A, yeah. into, yeah. into despair for four days afterwards, yeah. okay? He'll go... <laughs> Crikey, cock that one up and then go and set to do something to change it for next time to do the best he can. And the other yeah, thing here yeah, is that's the key on, there. he processes the effort, not the outcome. Mm. OK, the processing and the self, the feedback to yourself has to be effort orientated. Right. So if you if you're 10 years old again and you're going to play a game of football tonight your team is playing the next school's team right and you play really well that's a success that's great congratulations well done you've won okay because winning is about putting loads of effort in okay if you just happen to win the game as well then that's a bonus but whether you win or lose the game in goals or points that's not the reality of whether you won or not. Winning is putting the effort in to get better each time. You process the effort you've put in, not the outcome. Because you might be playing the best, the best school football team in the county, right? And you play brilliantly and you still lose 6-0. Does that mean you're an idiot? Does that mean you fail? Of course it doesn't. Does that mean you were no yeah. good? It's a waste of time, all the practice you've been doing? No, no, no. You can't compare yourself to other people. You have to compare yourself to the amount of effort you put in to make a difference. 
right? And if someone's putting effort in every day to change something, congratulations, well done. If there are setbacks along the way, which there always will be for metaphobes, you should meet those setbacks with compassion and confidence and know that you've got to have them. Yeah, Jordan yeah. had to yeah. fail 10,000 times in scoring a goal, uh, scoring a basket. That's how we learned to score a basket. You've got to keep missing to know it. I was playing hoops on the beach yesterday. Okay, you got to keep, this is thrown, actually it's not even proper, it's thrown a frisbee to try and land on a, on a, on a cricket stump, right? You've got to keep missing it in order to find it, right? Mm. You, the more times you miss it, the more times you'll find it. If I said to you, right, I'm going to play hoops today, Joe, but I'm not allowed to miss it. I should be able to get this every time now. That's so unrealistic. Mm. Yeah, you've got to keep getting close to the hoop, right, to know how to get to the hoop, to know how heavy the frisbee feels today in this wind, with the sun in my eyes, in this direction. You've got to keep missing in order to get it right. Each time you miss, you get a little bit closer. Imagine if Jordan, yep. every yep. time he missed a basket, beat himself up. You know, he wouldn't have got anywhere. Yeah, I was, um, yesterday, as you're talking about playing hoops, I was playing um, tennis. Uh, I play at a local club near me, and I was doing a, an assessment to move up um, from the immediate, uh, the intermediate to the advanced intermediate. But I was playing, the, they do like a play-in, right? So they assess you to make sure that you're capable of going up. And the people that I was playing against were like the, the team, like the super advanced, okay. like the high, high-end people on there. Um, and I lost every single game in a row, right? And you could look at that and go, oh, well, you're, you're absolutely shit. You're a massive failure. How could you lose every single game and still be happy with your performance, right? But it wasn't about me winning games. It was about whether or not I could, you know, do my best under circumstances that were far out of my league, right? In the same way with the football, you're playing the best team in the county. It's not about whether you win or you lose. It's about how well you can do. You know, I came away from that and I was really happy with myself because I was able to return some of their serves because I was able to score a couple points here and there, yeah. right? My expectation wasn't to absolutely excel and annihilate the team players. Mine was, okay, I'm going to do my absolute best to show how well I'm capable of doing. And I did that, right? And, and that, that is... Yeah, and at its basic level, go on. the will or the drive to compare yourself against someone else has at its base mm -hmm. every time social anxiety. Okay, if you yeah. are used to thinking you're not as good as other people and you're continually comparing yourself to other people, that's the most likely reason for someone to keep thinking that they're failing or they're putting themselves down. You should only be comparing yourself to yourself. How much effort you put in. There's that story I've told before of there were a thousand people that went for one job at Microsoft in Cambridge, right? And only one person can get the job. And if the other 999 people process the fact they didn't get the job as failure, well, it wasn't their fault at all. Maybe, may, maybe there was a bias on behalf of the interviewers, right, that wanted someone your age. Maybe there was an unconscious bias towards bald people. Maybe they wanted a female. Maybe they wanted someone with a degree. You know, it's not my fault. I haven't failed, right, if they just didn't like bald people. If they wanted someone younger, older, with more experience, with less experience, th that had a different accent. You know, you're not failing at that. So those 999 people, if they saw their goal as getting that job, they're going to feel like they failed, okay? Mm. If they saw their goal, though, as doing everything they could do to get that job, and they did some research, and they did a good interview, and their CV looked great, and they engaged the interviewers, blah, 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 they should congratulate themselves, pat themselves on the back, say, Brilliant, successful, well done me. Okay, because they did what, what they were there to do brilliantly. If they get the added bonus of getting the job, that's just the icing on the cake. Okay, but for the effort they put in, they've won. Congratulations, pat yourself on the back. Yeah? Cool. Yep. Lovely, I think that's right. about it. And yeah, no, that's definitely a... Um, it... it 
one thing. Self talk. Yeah. Sorry, go Joe. On. Sorry, Joe. Being a bit staccato. Uh, one thing. Generally, then, if someone says generally, what does that inner voice want to sound like? How do I change? What do I do with it? Okay. If you were the most loving, kind, charitable parent there was, how would you talk to a child that you loved? Okay. Mm. Kind, charitable, loving, forgiving, forgiving, right? Forgiving, kind, caring, okay? With perspective, okay? That's what that voice wants to sound like. Okay. In the big scheme of things, are you a complete bloody idiot because you spilt a pint of milk on the floor? No, you're not. Mm. Even if you've done it five times before, it doesn't make you a complete bloody idiot. That's just the parent's frustration that's coming out at you. Okay, That's about them, not you. You want a kind, calm, charitable, motivating, um, supportive inner voice, and you want to get to the point where you like yourself, where you approve of yourself, where you're happy with yourself. That's what the goal is. Mm -hmm.